Looking forward to chatting with this gentleman tonight. I came across his program on YouTube, and I encourage everybody out there to check out his content. He's putting out some really great content, really interesting story, and I'm glad he's here tonight to share it right here on Dusty Vision TV. Ladies and gentlemen, I have Chill from 16 to Life. What up, man? Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me on, Dusty. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I appreciate you joining the show, and um, I definitely appreciate the great content you're putting out, man. And I just discovered your music today, dog. I didn't even know you made music. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. When you when you get a chance, check it out, man. Oh, I'm on it already, dog. Just with this uh, ga- uh, Never Gave Me Therapy joint. So I'm, I'm definitely going to go down that rabbit hole and see what else you got co- cooking. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's take it all the way back, man. And I encourage, once again, everybody to subscribe to his YouTube channel, 16 Da Life. It's <laughs> the number 16 DA Life. And it's a great channel. He tells some really good stories, puts some humor to them. And it's just very entertaining cat, man. Um, so let's uh, take it all the way back, Chill. Tell everybody where you grew up. Uh, I was born and raised in the city of Bannon, California. It's a small town, uh, maybe about an uh, hour and a half east of L.A. Talk to us about what it was like growing up in Banning in the 70s and 80s. Uh, well, I was born in 71, like you said. I was raised in the 70s and 80s. And Bannon was a real uh, extremely small, close-knit, family-oriented town. So, you know, uh, everybody knew everybody back then. And, you know, we grew up where... Um, we respect people's moms and sisters and stuff. Like, like I said, it was a uh, one big family, one high school town. And so it was real, you know, it was real, real together. My, my mom, you know, she, uh, she knew the, she grew up with the mothers of, of my friends and stuff. So it was, it was real cool. Okay. And when did things kind of, you know, in your life take a turn to where the streets started to intrigue you a little bit? Uh, I would probably say like probably, um, summer of 85 maybe 86 you know just growing up just hanging out you know starting to be in the hood hanging out with the homies and i eventually got to selling weed and then later on moved on to crack and so maybe about that time okay 80s uh in los angeles where i'm where i live uh, was a war zone even for a civilian like myself um now in the 80s did uh did banning experience like a, a crack epidemic and did it affect your city as well yeah, most definitely. Like I say, probably about late 85, 86, you know, it hit maybe I would say 87, 88 when it started getting extremely bad. And so, yeah, you know, you had people trickling down from, you know, larger cities, L.A. and other other cities. And yeah, it slowly made its way down there. And uh, it was pretty bad as well. OK, um, tell us about the first time you started selling crack. Right. Well, if I can recall um, either. The first people I seen with crack was probably either my homie Scotty Ware, rest in peace, or my cousin James, you know. And uh, so, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm selling weed, and, and then I know these dudes were selling, you know, they, it was more profitable. You know, weed, weed was much slower. And then so I'm where I'm hanging out with my homies when we play basketball. I have a few of them, you know, they out there. They're, they're selling dope, running up to cars and stuff. <laughs> so excuse me, I, I got <laughs> I got a cold you guys have to excuse me. And so I slowly, you know, I slowly got into it like that, man. Um where you know, one of my homies said, Hey man, when you know, if you give the homie right here twenty dollars, he'd give you forty dollars worth of dope. And so that's how I pretty much got into it like that. But it was always just relatively small because I'm I'm trying to hide that I was selling drugs for my parents. So I you know, I never just went went, you know, just real big with anything just you know relatively small because my mom was the type of mother where she recognized if i came home with some new shoes or a shirt that she hadn't bought just you know, stuff like that mm. okay when did you first hear about crips and bloods you know in banning i probably would say uh 80 maybe about 82 i believe it was i was just thinking about this the other day and uh you know um I had an uncle who had went to YA and who had also, he had lived in Compton at one point, you know, so it slowly trickled back with different individuals. And, uh, I remember, like I say, um, we had some older homies running around and, um, uh, they was, well, the older homies at one point in time, you know, I, I remember one of the homies, he, he was hollering, he was hollering crib. And then we had a, a other dude, they was hollering blood, but it was kind of really just like red and stuff. And that's about the first time I kind of really remember hearing about it. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what uh, what gangs were around before Crips and Bloods made an appearance in Banning? 
And then, no, we just had some uh, just some homies hanging out. I, I believe they were just claiming East Side Baddies, but there was you know there was no really no really gangs out there like that. Gotcha, gotcha. How dangerous was it selling crack in 1985, 1986? Well, in 85, 86, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. But then, like I say, maybe around 87, 88, that's when it got, uh, it got extremely bad. You know, uh, a lot of people who, uh, by that time who had, you know, who had got into it now, they're starting to develop real big habits. And, you know, so yeah, that's when I would say it started, you know, it started getting pretty bad. We had, uh, maybe, and I think 80, I believe 86, we had a, um, a home girl. She was about uh, 16 years old. She ended up getting killed by, um, I think she was dating a crack dealer from another, uh, from a bigger city. And he happened to pull a gun and start shooting somebody. Somebody uh, had stole his drugs. And uh, so she ended up getting shot. And back then that was extremely traumatizing for the town. Cause like I said, you know, we all knew her and that was the first murder of, of my generation. Um, and so, you know, by, like I say, by, by, uh, by her being a female and just, it was just, you know, back then women were extremely sacred. You know, we didn't call women bitches and stuff like that. Cause like I say, we all, you know, everybody was like one big family. Everybody was friends and stuff. So her name was Kim and just her death was just really devastating. And I, and I would say that was probably just the first, the first moment when things just started getting real bad. Okay. All right. So mentioned 82 you you're you're starting to hear about crips and bloods now let's fast forward about six years uh pretty popular movie came out called colors 88 i do believe it was so you're probably running in high school around this time take right. me back to to what you remember about the movie colors coming out well you know i, <laughs> I just remember that it was uh it was a big hoopla about it you know because that at that point in time, you know, the Crips and Bloods was extremely prevalent in L.A. And I remember, you know, it being kind of a big panic in some cities where, where they was trying to decide where they were, whether they was going to air it or not, you know. And uh, well, for the most part out there in Bannon, where we was at, uh, we didn't have no problem. You know, I remember going to the movie theater and checking it out and stuff. And so, but I, like I say, I just remember it seemed like it was more of a problem nationwide than it was in Bannon, you know. And right around the time, maybe even a little bit before, and I'm glad you were born in 71 because you experienced the growth of this, but, you know, you being an MC and, and being into music, um, what were your first thoughts when you started hearing groups like Ice-T, N.W.A., you know, King T, DJ Quick, you know, holler, holler their sets on, on record, and, and this thing called Gangster Rap came out? Oh, you know, it was, um, I, I loved it, you know, and, and I, I'll never forget the first time that I heard N.W.A., it was a dude by the name of Donald B. He had he had the uh, he had the tape, and he was actually from he was from L.A. He was from uh he was from the uh, family Swan area, and uh, he let let me listen to it. And so yeah, it was just extremely you know it was extremely uh, it hyped me up just to hear these dudes you know talking this talking this you know this raw music. And actually, to Ice T, he was always one of my favorites too. You know, Six in the Morning, and he had a few other songs that was extremely you know extremely nice. Yeah, definitely a good time in music. Um, when uh, when would you say you know you were most active in the streets? Like how old, what ages? I would probably say, probably maybe beginning probably like around maybe nineteen eighty eight, nineteen eighty nine. You know, nineteen ninety up up in the, up until you know ninety four until I was uh, arrested and went to prison. Yeah. Yeah, and I, de I definitely want to talk about that. Um, but, okay, so 88, 89, um, L.A., once again, it was that was probably when it was at its worst. 91, 92, 93 was really crazy in L.A. Like, we were having, like, 2,000 homicides a, a, a year. It was, like, crazy numbers. Um, when, when to, to the best of your um, remembrance, was banning just out of control the most active? Well, I would say pretty much probably – all those years, it was relatively bad. But if my memory serves me correct, I believe 93, 94, I believe Bannon led Riverside County in murders per capita. And so it was extremely, uh, it was extremely bad that year. You know, like I say, Bannon's a small, one high school, one McDonald's town. And I think it was close to like 19, 20 murders, something that year, if I'm not mistaken, it was somewhere around there. So that's, that's the year that I would probably say it was, you know, it was definitely uh, one of his worst years, if not the worst. 
Yeah. And I know a lot of you cats out there here, 19, 20 murders. It doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind, Banning is a very small town. So 20 murders in a very small town per capita percentage wise is probably more than what Chicago is, was experiencing or LA or like a lot of other places around the country. 1994. Let's, uh, let's fast forward to 1994, a year that changed your life. Um, you ended up spending 24 years in prison. Uh, what led to, well, what happened, I guess, in 1994 that got you locked up? Well, like I say, by, by 94, I'm, um, you know, I'm full fledged into the streets, gang, uh, gang member. I'm also at, actually at that point in time, I was living in the state of Billings, Montana. I was out there selling, you know, large quantities of drugs. And I had came down, I had came back to California to purchase some more drugs. And there was an altercation uh, at a house party, and uh, uh, there were some people shot. And so I was, uh, I was being uh, wanted for those for that shooting. And so uh, I ended up going on the run, and I was eventually captured in uh, night. Well, that was nineteen ninety three. I was eventually captured in nineteen ninety four. And uh, when I was captured, I was also charged with another murder that um, that occurred while I was on the run. And so those are the circumstances that me to prison okay uh what, what was going through your mind mentally when the judge told you that you're getting that much time um well to be honest uh on my first on my like i said i had two separate two separate cases so on my first case which was an attempted murder uh well it was three three attempted murders and uh a great bodily injury. So they end up, well, I was in the, they end up finding me just guilty of great bodily injury and attempted murder. And so, uh, when the judge sentenced me, he gave me nine years plus life. And actually I was relieved because I thought I was going to get more time than that. So I got nine years for the person who was shot in the head, the great bodily injury. And then I had a, a plus life for the person who they said I was attempted to shoot at, who wasn't even hit. So they gave me nine years plus life. And then I still had a trail and murder case. Uh, excuse me, one, one step. Do your thing, do your thing. You'll hear my dogs bark too, so don't even trip. I got two dogs that love to bark as soon as I hit record. Right, okay, so now, uh, all right, I'm back. Okay, so you said nine, uh, nine you were saying nine to life? I had, yeah, no, I got this nine years plus life, and then like I say, I also still had a trail in murder case. Gotcha. And how did that lead, lead to you end up doing 24 well eventually i end up um taking a deal for voluntary uh, voluntary manslaughter on the murder and so they end up giving me uh they they ran the 16 concurrent with the nine but they ran it consecutive to the life so now instead of instead of nine years plus life i ended up with 16 years plus life which is i had to do 16 years which was Back then, half half of the sixteen, then I would start on the life, and uh, the life sentence was you had to do seven before before you'd be eligible for parole. So that's how I ended up with with sixteen plus life. I ended up taking a deal, and he ran it. Uh, he ran it con concurrent with the nine, but consecutive to the life. So instead of nine plus life, I just ended up with sixteen plus life. Gotcha. And you were sent to a level four one eighty prison, uh, specifically Salinas. Right. Talk to us about, you know, what it's like for an active gang member entering Salinas. And Salinas was a fairly new prison at this time, right? Extremely new, yes. Um, the yard, you know, the yard that I went to, we we opened the yard. Actually, the cell that I went into, you know, I was the first one in that cell. It was, it was still dust and screws uh, on the floor and stuff. And by me never being to prison, I didn't even realize how extremely dangerous it was because I had never been to prison before and it didn't, you know, it, this is one of those newer prisons, uh, a 180 is like a, it's, it's a newer prison, a new design. And so, you know, I'm not seeing all these bars and stuff like I had and anticipated seeing or things that I, you know, I saw in the movie. So I really had no, no idea how dangerous it was until, you know, people started coming in from other prisons and, you know, all these stabbings and stuff started happening. And one thing that's, that's so dangerous about a new prison is you have all the different games, you know, you have, the, you know, the Crips, the Bloods, you know, the, uh, the Southern, uh, the Southern, uh, essays, you have the Northern essays, you know, you have the white, everybody's jockeying for position in space, you know, and in the event, these things can't be worked out, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's worked out through violence, you know, so that's just a, 
And then you have, you know, people coming from other prisons and, you know, hey, well, they say that this guy right there in this prison, he, you know, he told on somebody, so he needs to be stabbed and just, it just, you know, it, it was chaotic. And by me never being in prison before, all that was extremely, you know, extremely just uh, eye-opening. I've asked this question to several people who've served time in both, but in your opinion, what is more dangerous, uh, prison or, or jail? You know, like a county jail versus big prison like Salinas? Well, I think it just all depends on what, what county jail you happen to be in. My, my county, Riverside County, it wasn't uh, nowhere near as dangerous as, uh, as prison. So, you know, in my experience, it was definitely prison. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Now, um, all right. So you're, you're in prison. Um, now do, at that time, were all the blacks getting together, you know, for numbers, or was it like still on with your enemy? Like, if you saw, let's say, a blood or something like that, are you scrapping off site, or were you guys getting together for numbers, black wise? Um, in prison, it was, it was, it was, it was like the blacks were more united, you know. And, and I want to say that I feel like in nineteen ninety six, you know, ninety seven, ninety eight, up in there, that was the that was pretty much kind of like the end of where, you know, like a lot of black unity, uh, a lot of, especially like Crip on Crip love, you know, sometimes, you know, you still, you still would have people who would just uh, on the strength of you being a Crip, they, they would embrace you. And uh, gradually that started fading out. And so there was always, you know, pretty much peace for the most part with the bloods, you know, uh, they had their little area and we had our area, but we wasn't just clashing and stuff. Matter of fact, when I first, when I first left the County jail, and got sent to reception center in Tehachapi. Uh, you know, there was a few of us Crips and Bloods who were sitting at the table playing, playing uh, dominoes together. And it, it was crazy to me because that was my first interaction with being around Bloods. You know, that was back when you know, um, you know, I, I, I was just used to being around Crips and so. But that was we, you know, we was respectful. This older, uh, older dude by older friend. Um, he, by the name of Dan Tanner from Long Beach Insane, you know, so he was late to me just basically on the, on the prison politics. Like, you know, you don't, you don't holler cuz in front of the bloods because it was disrespectful and vice versa. You know, if, if a person was going to do that, they had like, um, areas like the Crips would, would hang in a certain area and it was permitted. It was permitted like that, but like in, in neutral places like the chow hall, maybe, you know, the out, out on the yard where everybody could hear you, it was just, it was, it was seen as disrespectful. So, you know, it was just, uh, it was, for the most part, a lot of like togetherness and things like that. So it wouldn't cause, you know, riots and, and stuff like that. Cause that was back when people was really gang banging. And of course a blood doesn't want to hear a crip hollering cuz and vice versa. Gotcha. Little things like that, that you need to know. That's interesting. Um, now you were in there for 24 years. I'm sure you talked with many, many people, you know, throughout that time. What percentage of people would you say, if you could give an estimate are locked up, because someone told on them. Oh, uh, for violent crimes, I would say a large percentage. I would almost, I would, I would like to probably say, I would like to say probably a hundred percent. You know, <sighs> ninety eight, a hundred percent. Because there's always, you know, it's always people telling, and uh, you know, um, you, you you're gonna still have a, you know, you, you at least back then you still had. Uh, a majority of people, you know, sticking to the code and staying solid, but there's always been people who don't want to go to jail. And I've never ran across anyone who didn't have someone, you know, uh, telling on them in their, in their case. Listen to that kids out there who have that ride or die homie. This is my homie, man. We going down, we going down together, all that. Listen to what this man just said, dude. Most likely if your homie is facing football numbers, his ass is going to tell on you. If, if you got, if you got if you got five individuals caught up in a case, two of them is telling at least. You know, two of them is gonna tell. And I've seen dudes with tough tough gang banging names come to jail, and you know these these real tough gang banging names. And I, and I won't throw this dude out there, but he came to jail and he was uh he was facing six years and was in the cell crying. You know, he was looking at six years, and you got you got all these other dudes in there facing life, and you know he had a real vicious gang banging name. And, I believe he had accidentally shot his girlfriend or pointed a gun out and the gun went off, but you know, he was in the cell crying. So his, his celly came out, told everybody he was clowning him, but it's just stuff like, you know, people think it's, it's uh, like this gang banging stuff is a joke and they act hard until they get caught up in the situation, which reminds me of another quick story I'll share with you. Uh, I was a porter at some point in time in, in the County jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, 
used to get a lot of magazines, a lot of rap magazines, a lot of books. And so this guy, I, I'd seen him come in and out and he came in and he said, Hey man, let me get one of those books. And I said, well, you, you know what you want a rap magazine, a, a double XL. He said, no, uh, I need a Bible. I, I, I just called a hot one, which is for those who don't know, uh, California term for, for murder is a hot one, you know, but the mm-hmm. first thing he wanted was a Bible, you know, but he wasn't thinking about a Bible the day before. And so it just, you know, when you're in there yeah. and the walls are closing in on you, Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes, you know, more people than not can't take it. Now, would you say the average <laughs> gang member, former gang banger, suffers from PTSD? No, I definitely, I, I definitely would, would say so. If and, and when I say gang banger, I'm talking about the ones who was really out there gang banging. Because, you know, you may have, you may have people from a gang, but everybody's really not out there gang banging, shooting and putting in work. But most definitely the, um, for the ones that's really doing it, you know, you have to, I believe, because at some point in time, I think it is, it doesn't sit right with your spirit, you know, to either see people kill, uh, uh, kill people up close and, you know, and by us growing up, you know, especially in, in our era and generation in the seventies and eighties, when the idealistic man, man was a certain way, you know, we were taught to just stuff our emotions and hold, hold stuff in. So, you know, you're holding all this stuff in, you know, you know, I'll be the first to admit, you know, I had a lot of crazy dreams in there, you know, dreams, my dreams was bothering me and just all types of stuff, you know? So, uh, and, and those dreams went on for years and years and years. So I definitely would believe it, you know, maybe a lot of people won't admit to it, but most definitely. Mm, damn. No, everybody, mostly everybody I've asked that question said pretty much exactly what you just said. So, um, man, um, now, 2018 you were released is my math correct right uh-huh 2018 damn okay what was the this is kind of a two-part question um what was the biggest change to your city after 24 years and was it better than you left it or was it worse well the biggest change i believe is just a lot of these the areas that were weren't once owned by a lot of black families everyone's pretty much moved out of there there are a lot of uh a lot of Hispanics now in the house, you know, who, uh, when my friends and stuff grew up in, you know, my, my grandmother's house, my, my father's house where I was raised, you know, and then also now you don't see dudes hanging out as much, you know, it's just pretty much, the streets are pretty much empty, you know, as, com- as compared to when I was hanging out, we had one certain block that, you know, every day was, you know, dudes is out there hanging out there selling drugs and stuff. And so it just, it seems like, you know, it seems like all the crackheads have disappeared too. So, but now it's much more homeless people. But yes. so that, that, that's the thing that I noticed, you know, right, right away. Yeah, man, that homeless situation is a sad one. And I just don't see how we're going to fix it, man. It's out of control right now, dude. Right. Man, man. Um, all right. I would love to talk a little bit of hip hop for our last 15 minutes or so. That's cool with you. Right. Close to my heart. Hip hop is close to my heart. Um, so were you, um, while you were locked up, were you, I'm assuming you were inside writing and stuff like that? Right. Yeah. Um, especially in the, in the earlier stages when I was locked up, you know, um, I used to write a lot. We would, uh, one prison, particularly Ironwood, we would go outside. Maybe I would say three to five times a week and, and be out, you know, you'd have a group of us out there rapping and stuff. So yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a fun way to pass the time. And, you know, you can only go to the site so many times and, and spit the same raps. And so that, uh, you know, definitely made me continue to stay writing and stuff. Okay. And once again, I encourage everybody out there to check out his music too. I just came across it myself. Um, definitely dope shit. Now, all right, so let's talk about this uh, this new type of music. Are you, are you have you been keeping your ear to the street? Are you familiar with the drill music scene? A little bit of the drill music, yes. Uh huh. Okay, cool. But you know what drill music is for the most part, right? Right. Okay, cool. Right. Right. Yeah. To explain to people out there who don't, you know, drill music um, popularized in Chicago <laughs> has moved to places like New York, and it's like it's it's everywhere now. But um, what makes this type of music, you know, a little more different is a lot of these guys are being very disrespectful in their lyrics. Um, They're doing disrespectful things like, you know, recording music videos at the enemy's gravesite and like just really, really disrespectful and and saying that the most disrespectful things in in song as well. Um, Not only that, uh, Chill, and and I'm telling you stuff you may already know, I'm just telling the audience real quick. Um, A lot of these guys are actually writing about what they're doing in the street. So a lot of these cats are getting arrested 
and and then the, the 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 feds all they have to do is listen to the lyrics and they're like oh shit this guy's literally telling the truth but uh, what are your thoughts on that whole drill scene how you know shit back in our day the gangster rappers were lying about what they were doing now they're telling the truth and it's, and it's crazy that you say that right because i was just telling a friend about two weeks ago i said yeah the gangster rappers or the drill rappers of today make our gangster rappers pretty much look like librarian you know yes. i mean because the, the way they're doing it now, they basically, they basically just relegated our our gangster rappers to really reporters. That's that's what I can say. You know, Ice Cube, N.W.A. Those guys were were reporting what was going on, as opposed to these guys nowadays. They're really out there doing it, and um, you know, it, it's it's crazy. Like you say, man, it's um, it's extremely disrespectful, and uh, and I've even noticed that some of that stuff has made its way to uh, you know to California because when I got out. I, uh, I watched a whole lot of that stuff, you know, because I was always curious when I was locked up to why maybe, you know, uh, 40 people would get shot over the weekend in Chicago. And so yeah. I, I came home and started watching that YouTube stuff and the drill stuff. And so, yeah, it, it's really, uh, it's really disrespectful and it's, and it's really crazy. And, um, you know, we're just definitely out of hand, you know? Yeah, man. What are your thoughts? And this is happening all over the country as well. It started in like Maryland and then like other courts just started picking it up over the past few years, but what are your thoughts on courts using rap lyrics to lock people up? Well, it's funny that you say that because they, uh, they use, they use my the rap lyrics against me as well. You Wait, know, I, I had, Oh, please tell us yeah. that story. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Well, I had some, uh, I had a song called on the run. And so, you know, I, I, I had mentioned some, you know, some things about, uh, the person who I was accused of shooting. And so when they raided my house, they, uh, they found those lyrics and, um, uh, you know, they, they came to court and, uh, you know, read the lyrics and all that old type of stuff. And so I definitely believe I, I still would have been convicted with, without the lyrics, but you know, that was just a, uh, that was just a point that that was just an, another point that the DA wanted to use, I guess, to try to get a conviction. So I definitely think that, you know, the, the rappers nowadays, they gotta be smart because if they can make any type of, uh, you know, connection to that, they're definitely gonna, they're definitely gonna use that because the DA is, the DA is looking for a conviction. You know, once he hones in on an individual and he believes that person is guilty, he's gonna do all he can to try to find you guilty. So, you know, if he has to bring your rap lyrics in there, he has to bring your mama in there, he's gonna do it. And so, yeah, dudes definitely need to be smart. And now, with all the time they're given, you know, it just, it's really, you know, it's just basically telling on yourself, you know. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think, uh, you know, just in the past few months, we've lost uh, some very prominent rappers, R.I.P. Draco, R.I.P. Dolph, uh, Slim Fo Hunted, I mean, Mo3, King Von, FPG. I, I could literally go on, dog. We'll be here for 30 minutes if I named all the rappers who died, you know, just in the past few years. But um, in your opinion, man, what, why do you think um, rappers are, you know, just such, uh, you know, why do you think a lot of rappers are dying right now? You know, honestly, I believe it's the culture and it's social media. You know, now that's another thing that I noticed when I came home. It seems like it's it's cool to be disrespectful. You know, and uh, back in our days, man, uh, we, we may be out there, you know, hanging out, smoking weed, or doing, but we may see the homie's mom come through or the put homie's father away. come put through. Put the weed away, we, yeah. Most definitely, we take our hats off, we hide the beer. You know, we speak all that type of stuff. Now it's just that. It's like no one is above being disrespected, you know, and then also with the social media, uh, you know, the social media, this, this, this spread where, you know, everybody is just cool. It's cool to be disrespectful. And I was, I was talking about that the other day. I don't understand why, you know, these rappers is a lot of them is, is getting big, big money. And I don't understand why are you creating beats for yourself where you can't even enjoy the money. Either you're going to prison or you're going to jail. I mean, if you're talking all this stuff, eventually, you know, you're going to run across somebody that you disrespect and so I don't I don't understand why a person would even put himself in that position and so to, to me it's like they don't have the right people it's, it's a combination of a few things they don't have the right people in their corner telling them that this is not the avenue to go down you know and uh, like you say all these rappers who, who passed away it's, it's, it's crazy but it's like they don't realize they're inviting this type of stuff you know because after it, it, it would seem like after you see six, six or seven rappers die uh, going along this path, you would change your path. But, you know, once again, I, I attribute that to just being young, being dumb, being stupid like I was when I was young. You know, I'm watching everybody go to jail and I'm thinking I'm not going to go to jail. I remember t telling my father told me, he told me, uh, 
you know, you better be careful. You know, they're giving, they're giving life for people who, who being convicted of murder. And I remember I told him, Hey, don't worry, dad, I'm not going to get caught. So it's just, you know, it's a combination of a lot of things, you know, and, and immaturity is, is one, you know. My last question for you, and then I would love to discuss your channel and what you have coming up next. Um, let's go back. Uh, okay, 14 is around the time you said you really started doing your thing. If you could hypothetically, chill, talk to a 14-year-old you, what would you tell him? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> and I tell him, you know, just to... uh get out of the streets immediately, you know, change, change your path because, you know, life and time is precious. And those are two things that you can't get back, you know, and uh, you can lose any one of them at any moment when you're, when you're in the street. Like I say, if you're really out there gang banging, you can, um, you can lose those and not to really get off course. But one thing that sometimes somewhat disturbed me sometimes when I was in prison is I have dudes who, who claim they was gang, ma- gang members ask me, what was it like doing life? And they would tell me, man, I don't think that I could do life. And I, my response was, well, then you really wasn't out there gangbanging. Because if you're really gangbanging, you can get life. You can get life just being in the car with your homeboy. You can, uh, mm. And I actually ran across a couple of people who fell, fell asleep in the car. They homeboy ended up shooting. They stuck to the code and didn't say nothing. So now you got a life sentence. And so, uh, yeah, so I, w- I would definitely just, I would have told myself just, you know, to uh, change my, you know, change my course. and find something better productive to do with my life, you know. That makes a lot of sense, man. Probably the biggest change in the world from 1994, no, definitely the biggest change in the world from 1994 to 2018 is technology. Now, uh, you're, mm-hmm. you're out in 2018. Uh, what made you start your channel, man? Well, my channel was basically, I started. I started my channel to, to put my raps on there. Like I say, I had a love for rap at some point in time when I was in prison, I had stopped rapping because I didn't think that I was ever going to get out and be able to do anything with it. But I always had that passion. So once I was released, um, I hopped right back into it. And so I started rapping and I wanted to, you know, release some of my music. My plan was to make some mixtapes and put them on there and stuff. And so, uh, at some point in time, I was going to this uh, producer and he called COVID. And so, uh, at that time I had like 173 subscribers and I didn't want, you know, I, I didn't want my, my people to stop checking for my page. So I was thinking like, well, dang, well, what can I do? You know? And I, it, it dawned on me that people were always extremely intrigued when I told them that I had done 24 years in prison. They didn't want to hear about, you know, the stories of what happened and what was it like up in there. And so, uh, I just started telling some stories about being in prison. And one day I looked up and one of my stories had probably done seven or 8,000 views and maybe about five or six hours and it, it climbed to somewhere around 16,000, you know? And so I just, I just continued. So actually I got into doing the prison stories. Just really, just really luck. It was, uh, you know, basically just luck. I love that, man. I love that. And as an artist, as a person who, you know, was in music even back in the nineties, how cool is it dog that in 2022 that you could record, you could produce, you could do your own video, like all from the confinements of your own room. Back in 1994, you'd have to pay somebody $500 to edit the video, somebody $500 to shoot it, somebody, five, you know, somewhere. And now you could just do it all from your home, man. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's extremely cool, man. And it, it would be much cooler if I had took the time while I was locked up in prison to learn a little bit about technology, you know, and that's one thing that's kinda, that kind of, that kind of hinders me because my lack of knowledge, um, about, about technology and, and how to you know do certain things. So when it's time for me to possibly upload a story or do this or do that, I'm, I'm at, you know, I'm really waiting for someone one else to help me. So, um, that's one thing like, like that's bad about going to prison. You know, you miss out on, on certain accomplishments and, and certain uh, advancements, you know, so you always can do more free than you can do in prison. But so back to, to answer your question though, man, it's, it, uh, you know, it's extremely cool and it's beautiful and stuff. Like I say, I just wish I knew more so I could take more advantage of it. Well, if this makes you feel any better, dog, you, you were born in 1971. You have a YouTube channel that has 16,000 subscribers. I would say you're literally in the top percentile of your, let's go just your age bracket period. So first of all, I want you to be proud of that dog. Um, secondly, if it makes you feel any better, you know, um, I knew nothing about this shit just two years ago. 
Literally, I knew wow. nothing about. I got a mixing board in front of me. I got all this equipment now. But all it takes, man, is just watching YouTube videos. Type in how to whatever, and how, whatever you want to learn is going to be on YouTube. This is me spinning game to you, um, you know. Um, and secondly, that being said, I've made every mistake twice on YouTube. So if you ever have any questions, dog, I'm a phone call away or I'm a text away. I'll set you know a few minutes aside to show you. You know, what I'm saying, oh yeah, do it this way, or maybe you could do it this way, or whatever the case is. Because I know how hard it is for someone probably right. half your age to even do this shit let alone you know what i'm saying someone your age so dog I'm, i just want to let you know man you're, you're doing your damn thing and just be proud of where you are right now you should be extremely happy with having sixteen thousand subscribers that's very very rare man hey thanks and i appreciate it dusty but you know like dusty I, I can't let you sell me short man i don't have sixteen thousand. i got thirty-eight thousand. Oh and damn, so, my bad. Uh, why did i say 16 how the hell yeah because I, I was like you got more than me dog yeah how did i say probably, oh, cause you said 16 you earlier with, that's why okay well probably you probably confusing with 16 to life or something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's one thing that i do want to say that i'm proud of because i've seen where uh youtube said it takes anywhere from a year or two to get a thousand subscribers in order to monetize your page. And so in the span of maybe about eight months, I've gained about 38,000 subscribers. And so that's so something dope. I'm definitely proud of, you know, that's and I have so over, I think over 3 million, over 3 million views of my, uh, of the stories that I put up. So I'm definitely, definitely proud of that. Yeah, man. Yeah, dude. I'm so, so happy to hear that, man. Dude. And, and I encourage everybody out there to check out his channel 16 to life. Number 16, D-A-L-I-F-E. You will be very, very entertained. Great channel, great content, positive cat. Man, um, what's next for you, and where else can everybody find you? The floor is yours, dude. Uh, okay, so what's next for me? I'm going to continue to drop more music. I would like everybody to check out. Uh, I got a song called Never Gave Me Therapy. It's on all streaming sites. You can also go to YouTube and type in uh, the number 16, D A. Life music, that's 16 life music. I have several videos up there that'll pop up. I have uh, a lot of audio songs that'll pop up. You can also find me on um, Instagram at 16 life, as well as I have a, uh, uh, I have a, uh, a web page, 16 life.com. It's a web page. I, uh, I, I have merch for sale up there, my music. And so uh, that's pretty much it. Love this song right here, dude. This never gave me therapy. This shit is so dope, and that's that's a big deal in the in the, the black community, the Latino community. Is we don't seek therapy, and I'm going to encourage everybody out there. If you have the resources, which we all have the resources, you've been through some shit. Please seek talk to somebody. Just talk to somebody, man. I mean, a lot of you guys, including my man Chill here, have have seen things that you know a dude that went to Afghanistan and, and Iraq and Vietnam have seen. So don't think you're a punk if you need to seek therapy, man. Um, is there anything you would like to add to that? Just even talking about this song? Uh, no, just pretty much like you say, man. Just uh, you know, don't 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 live your life according to the opinions of others, man. Trying to trying to live up to someone's expectations will definitely lead you down the road you don't want to be down. Man, sixteen to life, uh, chill. I really appre uh, appreciated this conversation, dude. I love your whole vibe. I wish you much su success. And, uh, dude, I look forward to staying in touch with you, man. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And like I say, too, Dusty, when you get a chance, be sure to type that in. 16 to Life Music. I have several audio songs up there, several videos. I definitely think you will, uh, you'll enjoy it. I'm on it, homeboy. This is my vibe right here, man. I'll talk to you soon, all right? All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Peace. Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace